Hi, Julie. Thank you so much for taking the time out today and joining me in this podcast episode. I really appreciate it. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, the pleasure is mine to uh, you have like a busy schedule and coming to the show and we have like a interesting topic to share with our audience, which is navigating and avoiding awkward conversation. So mm -hmm. before we jump into the topic, I'd uh, love to know more about you. What do you do? Will you help? So our audience will uh, know more, much better about yourself. Yeah. Yep. So my, uh, my brand is Your Conversation Expert, and I help people on a very wide variety of topics, everything from basic conversation 101, mm -hmm how to present yourself well, how to sound well-spoken, the sorts of things, to uh, small talk skills, which is very important for a lot of people just for their own personal um, needs and desires to be able to socialize, but yeah. also to um, business professionals or business owners who uh, who value networking as, as as an essential skill uh, that they need in order to make connections for their business or to potentially attract new clients. And yeah. then I go over a lot of uh, dealing with conflict and um, touching on really difficult topics such as illness and grief and how to lean into those difficult conversations instead of feeling the need to run away from them. Yeah. That's interesting. So uh, you are by profession, uh, you are a physical therapist, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. So uh, mm -hmm. also, also you're coaching other people as well, like uh, how to uh, be better communicator as well as like you doing physical therapy. Uh, that's your day job. Yes, my my W2 job is working as a physical therapist and I work in home health, uh, yeah. which primarily with the, you know, much older and retired age uh, community who, by definition, they have to be homebound. So they're typically mm. very, and not able to leave their homes very easily. So there's a lot of uh, tricky topics and conversations that come up in that space. Yeah. And that was something that really drove me into what I'm doing now with the conversation skills and topics, because I saw so many instances of families who obviously loved each other and cared for each other. Yeah. Really difficult things would come up. A lot of times they were saying things that were very hurtful or very isolating or, or they themselves were just hurting so much that they really weren't able to show up in a supportive way mm -hmm. to their family member. And I, I found myself facilitating a lot of these really difficult conversations and almost playing the mediator a lot of times. And so being able to help people to understand, you know, how someone reacts when they're hurt and how that yeah. may not be the best version of themselves or how to lean into uh, those when someone's very overwhelmed or they're really hurting, or there's a really serious, difficult topic, like end of life issues that are coming up. And how do you have the conversation instead of running away from the conversation? Yeah, that's great. So you saw the problem actually when you was doing a physical therapy for your clients and your patients and you discover like there is an awkward moment where you have to tell them certain things and they not going to take it like a easily because some people may not recover from the physical situation they are in or like it's getting worse or something so in that kind of awkward situation you come across with your day-to-day -day life could be business owners could be like a professional they have like a certain situation or could be like a, a boss telling their employee like a certain things and they're not comfortable telling them to do that so you came across with like you saw the problem for yourself and now you're teaching others how to do that. So tell us a little bit more about like uh, what kind of awkward situation we have in terms of like, uh, and we try to avoid it. So when you're actually coaching your clients. Well, for, for my clients, there could be a lot of things. Uh, one thing I didn't mention is that part of where my inspiration came from is from a group of women that I had become involved with who were all trying to upgrade themselves. So whether that is, uh, you know, whatever their education was, or maybe choosing a partner that might treat them a little better or having a better skincare routine or going on vacation in a nicer spot, just anything that was considered an upgrade, they were trying to just bounce ideas off each other and inspire each other um, to go for that. And I loved it. But 
one of the things that was happening was that a lot of them were putting themselves in these new situations that were very different and maybe uh, maybe it was a higher end restaurant than they'd ever been in before or a much more expensive store than they ever would have shopped in before. And they were coming back to the group and saying, I, re- I really embarrassed myself or something you know, crazy happened and I didn't know how to handle it. Or somebody asked me this question and I didn't know what to say. And all through my schooling, uh, in order to become a physical therapist, I had worked in department stores, uh, primarily as a bra fitter. So you can yeah. imagine <laughs> The conversations that, yeah. that yeah. came up at that point. And then I also worked for a collections company for a while. So there was a lot of different things in my journey that I was drawing on um, for them in particular that, you know, I would say, oh, if that comes up again, just say it like this. It, nobody will think anything about it. Or, mm-hmm. well, if that happens again, you could just handle it this way and it should fix itself really easily or just little things like that because of my experience being on the other side of the counter in the situations and knowing when yeah. customers said this to me or reacted in this way, it was well-received or when they acted in this way or said these things, it was not well-received. And so I was able to, to share. So that's kind of where the broader spectrum comes from. But some of the awkward conversations that people come to, a lot of times when people are coming to me for coaching, one of the first things is the small talk skills. It's right. how do you conversation with somebody you've never met before and how do you feel like you're connecting with them how do you you know there's all these questions in your head is this stupid does this person want to hear this am I talking too much am I Mm -hmm. oversharing um so a lot of times when people come to me that is actually one of the driving factors that will bring them to me to say I don't even know how to meet new people without feeling like I just want to hide in the closet (laughs) So yeah, interesting. Yeah. Like not many people actually talk about that, like uh, how awkward it gets, uh, like a certain thing, especially for like uh, being a doctor, physical therapy space is always awkward and nerve wracking situation you have to tell them. So when we had like our first child last year during the pandemic and a lot of doctors had to tell us like a lot of different things. So at the beginning when he went to ICU, uh, group of doctors like she didn't know like how to express it so they came with like five consultant and telling us he's not gonna make it next 24 hours and that was like really awkward she didn't want to like say it to directly and coming across with it like a different medical languages they, they're using to avoid like a certain things like not telling us like he's not gonna make it if it could be like a, oh your son not gonna make it that would be like really really weird and how someone's gonna respond to it that way she's explaining is basically like this is the situation this is the medication we're giving him this is not working and the ventilation is not working so we need to take that step and it's going to be so after like having a 15 20 minutes conversation the like, conclusion is not going to make an next 24 hours but god willingly he survived and he's doing well now he's 10 months old but that situation was really really awkward for i think right now i'm thinking uh like as a doctor or professional, how awkward was for her to like telling me and a bunch of doctors was there. And yeah, so I think what are you actually doing? It is like a telling, yeah. building people up to have a conversation. So when we're having like a, telling someone bad news or could be someone passed away, or uh, someone had a car crash, telling a c- certain way, telling them. So how, how do you teach your, and um, how do you coach your clients to tell in a way, like uh, other people don't get offended and uh, other people don't get like a uh, heart attack or something like uh, telling them there is a way to tell them. So how do you actually do that? Yes, that is so important that you bring that up, breaking bad news. And it's I love that you brought that up because it's something that uh, yeah. on the podcast I've done, nobody's asked me before, but it is so incredibly important. Um, what I like to do and what I encourage other people to do is to preface that conversation with some information to help set the conversation up for success. Uh So um, as a personal example, in in the line of work I do, there are times where the patient is not getting better, they're actively getting worse, and we realize, we recognize that they need to transition to hospice. But simply coming in and saying, you need hospice, we're leaving, 
you know, would never be well received and would never be the way to handle it. So a lot of times when I'm having to go in to have those conversations with people, the first thing that I will do is tell them, okay, we need to talk about something. I kind of set them up. This is, this is a conversation where we all need to be paying attention because it's going to be a little difficult, but I just say, okay, we need to talk about something. This might not be a great conversation, but we need to have it because I'm seeing this and this and this. So yeah. maybe I'm seeing this kind of decline or this sort of, you know, whatever it is that led me to the decision that that was best for them. And yeah. I go through that because I don't want to just come out and say, here's some bad news. The very first thing that I want to do is explain my thought process behind why we need to have this conversation. So I'm seeing this, or he has been in the hospital four times in the last three weeks for the same issue. We've done this and this, it's not getting any better, you know, and I'm yeah. and trying to run them through the timeline and I'm trying to run them through my thought process so that when I say, you know, if it's hospice, a lot of times I don't just say they need hospice. I will phrase it more of, um, at this point, it really feels like hospice might be the better option or that hospice might be able to provide services that right. we have to provide. So I try to help the person to understand why it's a more supportive option. Mm -hmm. The outcome, it, you know, and hospice is a whole other topic. So the person is not necessarily in imminent danger of passing away in the next week or two, just because they went on hospice. But yeah. most people do feel that way. They feel that it's a death sentence. Yeah. And so to, to make sure that I preface it by saying, we need to have a conversation. These are the things that I'm seeing that are making me feel like this might be a better option for you. That's going to give you the support you need that's going to be more supportive than what our services can do for you. I explain the difference, yeah. you know, home health that I do is a restorative service and hospice is a comfort service and they're able to provide this and this and this and this benefit. Um, what do you think? And mm -hmm. I, I always try to open the conversation. What, do, what are your thoughts about that? Or how do you feel about that? Or have you all considered that yet? Or is it something that you've thought about yet? Right. Because you never know. They might say, you know, we were actually just talking about that last night. I'm glad you brought it up. Yeah. I've had people say that too. Or I've had people say, we kind of thought he needed hospice, but we figured it was your call. So mm -hmm. they were waiting for us to bring it up. Or we have people that say, absolutely not. I'm not even willing to talk about it. Um, and you can go a little further and say, okay, well, could you just kind of talk me through your thought process? You know, I, I'm I hear you that you don't want to consider it, but can you kind of explain to me why so that right. I can understand it instead of just saying, well, you need it. And this is what we're yeah. doing. So it's mostly like individual thing, like everyone take a different way. Right. So some people really understanding and they know what they're actually doing and some people you need to convince them or like uh, show them like a different guidance and yeah like asking like a lot of question it really helps rather than you talking majority of the time so you rather listen to them then you can react to it and have like a better answer for the questions and that conversation makes it easier am i right yes it's you never know where somebody's mind is if you don't ask yeah you know I can, I can assume that you, that you could see that the person needed hospice and that you were right on board with it and that you, that it was obvious that this person needed hospice. That would yeah. be a really dangerous and unreasonable and irresponsible assumption to make. But for me to assume that you are going to be very resistant to it may not be accurate either. You might be surprisingly open to it because, because the suffering is so intense mm -hmm. and anything that can provide relief is welcome. So I can't know how you're feeling and how you're going to react unless I ask yeah. and then I can figure out if you're on board with it. My next thing is, okay, well, let me call the person who's going to help make that transition for you. Or if you're dead set against it, maybe we can problem solve through why, you know, a lot of people, they won't consider it because they think, well, you're just sending me over there to die. Mm -hmm. And to explain you know, no, 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 that's, I understand why you feel that way because 20, 30 years ago, that was true. Yeah. Um, but 
let me, you know, would you let me kind of walk you through all of the changes that have happened with hospice in the last couple of decades, because um, it's a very different service now than it was before. And I see if I can open that person up to being willing to have the conversation, but forcing your opinion, forcing your will, or just throwing something on somebody without prepping them first or without trying to test the waters a little to see yeah. how are they going to react to it? You're, you're trying to kind of anticipate how are they going to react to this so that I know what I need to do next to best support them. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree on that. So I'm still staying on a, a medical side of it in the next Absolutely. couple of minutes. So yeah. for people to Absolutely. understand more. So a lot of people have like a diagnosis of cancer or like have some kind of major illnesses and they need a surgery or chemotherapy. And a lot of people actually decline to go on certain things they prefer like not to have a surgery and not to go for chemotherapy and they're like oh i'm gonna give up on my life and not gonna take a head in the certain situation it's really hard to convince someone to go for like actual uh treatment they needed so how is a professional like yourself like will convince someone like this way that would be like well, really awkward isn't it <laughs> right it's it's very difficult but one of the things that I always have to keep in mind as a health professional is that the patient has the right um, to what we call autonomy. So they yeah. have the right to determine their course. So I don't have the right to force a treatment on that person. Mm -hmm. And it's important to keep that in mind. It's not my decision to make. It's their decision and it's their life. And I have to respect whatever decision they ultimately make. And yeah. I think being able to come to the conversation with that um, very, very real information in mind is so important. It's not my job to make you do something. I don't right. have the authority to make you take this treatment, but I do have, I can come to the conversation with compassion and understanding and with the intention to best support you. So if you, you know, let's just say that you had cancer and you're asking me, you know, what do you think I should do? Should I take this treatment? Um, yeah. Or you say, or maybe in this, the scenario you're, you're bringing up, let's say that, that your loved one yeah. has cancer and they are refusing to take the treatment and you're coming to me and saying, you have to convince them to take this treatment. Yeah. What I will actually do in that situation is I will sit them both down and say, you know, this, this is just tough. It's, this is just not a situation that anybody wants to be in. Mm -hmm. This is terrible news. The outcomes here that you've been given are not great. And the yeah. options that you've been given, they suck. I mean, I, I think that there's so much power in being honest. Yeah. A lot of times people want to sugarcoat it. It's not that bad. You can make it through. Let me give you a pep talk. But really, when a person is suffering and you try to jump straight to the good part, yeah. you are isolating them, you're, you're ignoring the very real feelings that they're having, and you're, you're basically telling them that how they feel doesn't matter. So sometimes by just being brutally honest, this absolutely sucks. And your mm -hmm. options here are not fun. These are not fun options. None of these options are, are what anybody would want to choose. They would wish they could choose none of it and just be healthy. Yeah. And sometimes speaking that out loud can be so powerful, but then trying to recognize the two people in the room are feeling a lot of different things. Um, maybe that maybe it's a married couple and I might address the spouse and say, I know that you are scared out of your mind right now that you're about to lose your spouse. It's mm -hmm. a whole feeling. I, I mean, I know that you feel totally out of control because the decision is not even up to you. The he, you can't do the healing for them and trying to speak a lot of those fears and worries and frustrations out loud um, for that person's sake, but also for the other person's sake that we're, we need to get all of this out on the table, but turning to the person who's sick and saying, you've already been through so much. Yeah. And being asked to do this next thing. I mean, I can easily imagine that that just feels like the straw that breaks the camel's back that you just, you might feel like you just don't have it in you to fight that fight. Mm -hmm. you no, know, 
can you talk to me? And that's, again, I can't yeah. know what you're feeling. I can't know what you're thinking. And I certainly can't help this situation if I can't get you to tell me what's going on in your head. So right. I might say, you know, talk to me. Can you kind of, I know that you are wanting to decline this treatment. Is it because you're just so exhausted that you don't feel like you can? Yeah. Is it because you don't see the point? Is it because um, you're, you're feeling like you're, you're ready to not fight this anymore. I mean, tell me what's going on in your mind and I will let them tell me because they're telling me, but they're also getting the chance to tell their spouse who otherwise may have been so scared and overwhelmed that they wouldn't let them say those words because they didn't want to hear it because they weren't sure they would handle it. If that person said out loud, I don't want to fight anymore. Mm. And having to hold space for those really difficult, conflicting emotions and trying to help everyone to realize that all of these feelings are legitimate. It's completely legitimate that you're scared out of your mind that you're about to lose your spouse and you want them to fight with everything they have. But it's also completely legitimate that you as the patient are spent you're physically emotionally and spiritually exhausted and you're mm. not sure much you've got left to give at this point you know and maybe once we're all on the same page and everybody feels like they've had a chance to express what it is that's overwhelming them then you can move the conversation to a point of so what do we do about it you know i know that you feel so emotionally spent but what if you know is it possible to Put the, put the treatment off for two or three weeks so that you can just get a couple of weeks to just rest and recover from this other treatment that you just finished. Yeah. You know, and see if that sounds, you know, you can still problem solve through it. Is there a way that we can get everybody's needs met at the same time? Is there a way that we can better support one or the other or both of you in this scenario? Is there maybe another option here mm-hmm. that, haven't thought of yet that might be more appealing and that the person might be willing to do instead. Um, Or if the person really truly just, they've just given up their diagnosis might be terrible where they're being told you've got two months. If you take this terrible treatment, you might get eight months, but the the entire eight months, you're just going to be so sick. It's like, what's that? You know, and in that case, the, the conversation has to shift to accepting the things that we change and having to facilitate that conversation. So there's, there's multiple layers, but it, it always has to come back to if in any situation, if you as the person can realize that you don't have control over Mm. the person, all you can do is support them and have compassion and help facilitate the conversation and to try to help yeah. you're going to get much better outcomes than just trying to say, well, in my opinion, you need to do this, or I'm a professional and I'm saying it's got to be this way, or, well, you're just not thinking about this, or you're not considering that, or you're not, you know. Yeah. Just a blaming others, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah blaming and controlling. Never yeah. Works. <laughs> yeah. Telling the truth is always important. So both parties knows actually what's going on and accepting it at the same time otherwise later and down the road they're going to get the more shock and that's not good for both person the professional and also the patient so yeah the topic is really really interesting and a lot of questions pouring on my mind right now so can use our relationship use it in the business so let's talk about business as well so as an employee of a company let's say i'm working there for, for five years or six years and I haven't got any raise, no promotion. I should be getting something, but having the conversation put on the table. And I'm taking like a two years, three years time. I haven't ever spoke about it. And the boss or like whoever top of me, like making the decision, they have a noticed. So how can I start the conversation? Like it happened with me when I was 17 years old. I had my first job in a takeaway, working there and I was just getting underpaid. And I had in my mind, or oh, if I ask him for a raise, if he's gonna uh, suck me from the job and I'm gonna lose a job, 
So that's how I like, it took about one year before I actually asked my boss for a raise and he actually did that. But most people goes years and years thinking about they might lose their job if they ask. Um, they're trying to avoid the conversation uh, totally. So how can someone ask in a, in a manner where they can get the raise and don't lose their job? <laughs> right. <laughs> so I think, again, it's so important to be able to prepare a conversation ahead of time. So yeah. a lot of times in any situation, business, relationships, friendships, any of it, if you just throw a conversation on someone that they're not prepared to have, mm-hmm. come is not usually what you're hoping for. Right. Um, be making a request of someone uh, at a bad time, or the two of you might be on different pages. So, um, you know, who knows that boss could have thought that you were not, you know, the whole time thinking, well, at any day, he's just going to quit. Cause I think that he's probably planning on doing this and yeah. you're going, I was planning on working this job for 10 years. Why are you not, you know, right. and so yeah. it can be a miscommunication. And so one of the best tips to set yourself up for success in that scenario is to have a conversation with your boss ahead of time. A really timing, especially if you've never done this before, um, is maybe on the anniversary of when you were hired. Um, and that can be broken down. It could be a six month point or it could be the one year point. Yeah. Um, but I know when I, um, let's just say a job that I'd taken several years ago, uh, I came in, I'm doing the job. I had never done it before. So yeah. I knew that the salary I was being given was at an entry level salary because I had no experience doing that particular job. Yeah. Um, and then six months into the job, I thought to myself, I do like this. I am planning on sticking around here. Um, also, I'd like to get paid more. Uh-huh. So I went to my direct supervisor and said, I had the conversation. I've been working for the company for six months. I'm really enjoying it. I can really see myself working here for a while. Um, I know that we're about halfway between when I was hired and my first yearly review. And I want to know what it is that you want to see from me in order to have the best review possible and in order to be considered for a raise. Um, Because I know that I was hired at an entry level um, yeah. salary because I would, because I didn't have any experience, experience. one year point, um, you know, I would want to do what I need to do in order to earn a raise mm-hmm. and having that conversation. You're already putting it in their head way ahead of time that you do want the raise. You are planning on having the conversation. So you've already planted the seed at the one year mark. Yeah. I am getting on us having a conversation about me having a raise, but especially when you're new to the job, giving a six month lead up can be so beneficial to getting a raise at all or how much of a raise you could potentially earn. So some questions that you can ask that um, are not threatening, they're not going to be, um, people are not going to get upset about it is to ask, you know, how do pay raises work at this company? Right. Um, what, what is the structure for reviewing and um, authorizing raises? So you're not really saying, I need a raise. I want one right now. Will you give me more money? But you are letting them know you're interested in that conversation, yeah. letting them know that you're interested in doing what it takes. Because the other thing is, um, a long time ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, simply putting in more years did warrant increased pay. Okay. You've been here two more years. Here's more money. Okay. You've been here another year. Here's Mm -hmm. more. But in today's society, it never works that way. I I don't know a single job where it works that way. Um, It is only based on merit. So if you are not doing the things that are going to inspire your boss to give you a raise or to give you a good raise, because they could throw such a small amount at you that you're like, just keep it. Yeah. (laughs) Um, You know, so in order to get the actual raise that you want, you need to know what they want to see out of you. And you're not going to know that if you don't have the conversation. And when you're approaching that way, collaboratively with your boss, I'm not just coming to you and asking you for more money. I'm asking you, what do you want from me that would inspire you to give me the raise that I want? What Mm -hmm. are the things need to see from me because I know that I have fallen into this trap before where 
I might think that something is really important. Yeah. And somebody else might think, I didn't even know, I didn't even know that was an option. It's certainly not on the top of my priority list. So you need to know what your boss values. Do they value, you know, well, usually the people who get the best raises in here stay after work an hour, a couple of days a week. You know, we like to see that level of dedication. Or, you know, well, the best raises around here are given to people who show the, the most performance on this or yeah. who do the best on these particular metrics. Or, um, well, for you, I think you've been doing a good job up to this point. Let's just use this job that I had, for example. You know, you're doing really great. Um, you need to make sure that your documentation is always in on time. You need to make sure that you're, you know, always meeting your productivity standards for the week. Um, we, you know, no customer complaints, yeah. you know, and they would be able to give me four or five things. And then here's what you can do with it. Firstly, you've had the conversation so that the boss knows it's coming and they're yeah. ready. Second of all, you've figured out the list of what I need to do to get the raise. And thirdly, you've given yourself enough time to adjust. Mm -hmm. If I come to you three to six months ahead of time and say, I am looking at having this conversation with you in June, what do I need to do between now and June to set myself up for success when we have that conversation? And yeah. now we're working together and it's not guaranteed, but it is a teamwork. It's yeah. it you and your manager creating a plan for how you're going to get a raise yeah. <laughs> instead of just whether or not you're going to get it. It makes it easier, isn't it? Yes. Also, so, you find out like, uh, are they you know, able to give you the raise because a lot of, lot of companies are not profitable and they can't really actually pay a certain amount. So yep. by asking the question, you will know like a six month time, the company doesn't have the budget to give the everything, even though I impress the boss and I do everything I need to be doing, then you can think about uh, if I need the raise, because everyone different, like some people need the raise because the bills is high, mortgage payment is high, car payment, they probably have a new child. So you're probably thinking about leaving the job and look for a better job because there is no growth you can see here. So yeah, like you mentioned, asking them kind of question is gives you enough time for six months or a year ahead. So you can plan out, I have, in this company, do I have a future or not? If not, then I can look for uh, other alternatives. So yeah, uh, you know, you, you're really, really tough. So I'm going to ask you another question related to business wise. So since you've been coaching the business owners, so how business owners like to get in clients and like new customers, how the communication would be for like closing more deals and certain things? Well, I think uh, in, in all of the business space that I'm seeing right now, you hear over and over, people will purchase from people who they know, like, and trust. Yeah. So if you can keep those things in mind, it can help to direct your actions mm -hmm. uh, with those people in order to make sure that you're having the outcomes that you want. So if it's somebody who doesn't know you well at all, you need to understand they don't know me. So just pitching them out of the blue is going to be a lot more difficult. What are some things that I can do to help them to get to know me better? Um, so there are a few ways that I personally go about it. And so I'll just kind of share um, if someone is, is kind of confused, well, what do you do? Or I'd like to learn more about it, but I can feel that there's a lot of hesitation there because they're not familiar with me at all. Yeah. A lot of times I'll direct them to my website. So, you know, what's a great place to start is just go yeah. to my Right, because I there are tons of free resources on my website. Um, the podcasts that I do, I post them on my website so people can go and listen to them. Mm -hmm. They can hear my voice, they can hear my thoughts, they can see what I'm doing. Uh, they can also see um, have a lot of guides, free resources that they can download and interact with my material risk free because they yeah. didn't have to pay anything for it. There's an about me page on there so they can learn a little bit more about who I am and my journey. So that's a great way um, for people who are especially hesitant to learn mm -hmm. to know me better um, without me pushing myself on them. Uh, I will also encourage people to come find me on Instagram because I, I've gotten really into the reels. I like the reels. <laughs> Is I feel like it shows a part of my personality that you might not get to see otherwise, because when I'm here and I'm speaking with you, I'm, I'm in my professional mode with, this is a serious yeah. conversation. 
action. We're here to learn and, and do, but, um, you know, but there is a part of me that that's just funny and silly and likes to have a good time. And there's sometimes there's not a great way to show that, except I've found through the reels. So there's, there's fun ways that you can help people to get to know you better. Mm-hmm. And then as far as liking you, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so <laughs> that can be tricky, but really when it comes to liking a person, it's a lot of times, whether someone likes someone or not is whether or not the person seems friendly, whether or not they seem open, whether or not they seem willing for yeah. conversation. Yeah. So if I'm speaking with you and your tone of voice is condescending, mm-hmm. that's going to turn it off right there for me. The second that someone starts speaking to me in a condescending tone, I'm out. Um, or if the person seems like they don't, you know, that confidence factor, if, yeah. if, if, if you're not able to convince me um, that you have confidence in yourself or confidence in what you do or confidence in your product, um, it makes it hard for me to like what you're doing because mostly it's just so awkward. Yeah, um, yeah. So being friendly and being open and being honest, uh, I think that's so important to, to tell someone when they don't know something. I'm really big about that with my kids, especially. So how does, how does this work? And I just... Mm-hmm. I don't know, but we can look it up. Yeah. You know, if somebody asks me a question in business. Um, is this possible? And I'll say, I don't know, but I can make a phone call and find out. Yeah. And I think that's very important to, for building trust. Um, so, and that comes back to the no like, and trust factor. So the trust is, do you, are you going to do what you say you're going to do? Are you who you say you are? Mm-hmm. I think for me, that's a lot of it is there's so it's so easy for people to um, pull one over on other people. There's so many spam accounts out there. There's so many, there's so many people out there that are, they're just out there to make a buck and they're going to do and say anything it yeah. takes to get your dollars and then they're going to run. So do yeah. I trust that you're a good person? Do I trust that you're going to say what you're, uh, you're going to do what you say you're going to do? Um, so I think that coming back to some of those conversations we were having earlier, when you're speaking with people, being honest, being open, saying some of those things out loud, like this is really tricky or saying, you know, I have not encountered this before. Can you give me a day or two to figure a couple of things out and get back Mm -hmm. with it? People will wait for the right answer. (laughs) Um, And they will, that will build a lot of trust rather than just trying to, you're just trying to make it up on the spot. Yeah. People, people can tell that if you think that you're pulling one over on somebody, you mm-hmm. are not, or you might get away with it this much, but not in the long term. Yeah, that's excellent advice. So basically, you're saying for businesses need to do like to more personal branding, so people yes. will know and they will know who you are, what you're actually doing, so they can trust you in a way to have a conversation about your product and services. And then obviously, if someone likes you, then do business with you. If not, that's totally fine. But at least you're giving the chance for someone to trust you and know who you are and what you actually do. And being honest about it right now on social media, if you're saying something uh, about a certain topic and you go on another social media platform and talking about against it, so that's not how you're going to build a trust. A lot of people actually do that. Like they go on a podcast, they say, oh, I'm against it. Like you're waking up early in the morning but they actually waking up six in the morning and doing their business. <laughs> so if someone finds out about that, then that's not actually aligned with what you're actually saying and what you're actually doing. And yeah, that's great. So now let's move from business to let's talk about relationship. I just wanted to touch on that as well. We have a lot of awkward conversation with the spouses or partners in a certain way. And sometimes because we worry about how the conversation going to turn out and we don't, actually have the conversation and that leads to like a divorce or breaking up and things like that a certain way like uh, if a woman get pregnant after having a child of birth they put some weight on for the husband probably not like the person or something they go on having another relationship or like thinking of getting a divorce actually that problem could be solved doing something together right <laughs> um <laughs> solve, solve the conversation but we actually don't do that uh, could be like a, even though could be opposite way and uh, like a wife looking into the husband's some different kind of situation probably he's smoking he's drinking too much and 
thinking about how the conversation is going to turn out, we actually don't say that to the person we wanted to. And don't smoke in the house, uh, quit overall. I don't like smokers and things. Even though before we get into a relationship, we don't have like open-ended what kind of things we want from the person. Sometimes mm-hmm. it's like a self-doubt. You don't actually like uh, going in the parties, but you actually doing it for the person, for him or her. And that later on, after you get to marriage after two years or three years, you realize, oh no, this is not something I wanted to sign up for, but I'm stuck right now. But if you had the conversation at the beginning, uh, I don't like like going to parties. I don't like being get too socialized or like uh, having, I don't like going to Italian place. You always take me. <laughs> uh, I prefer more Chinese. So how do you actually have that kind of conversation to avoid like a big breakup, big divorces? I think uh, a lot of what you've touched on too is uh, really being honest. I'll kind of address the second. So being honest up front with your partner uh, when you're in the dating phase, before you've made these more permanent decisions, especially once you have children together. Um, yeah. I have two children excuse me, and I can tell you for sure, (laughs) Um, there is a difference between being married to someone and having children with that person. Because, you know, as much as as divorce is never the outcome that you're hoping for, if there's children involved, you can go your separate ways and never see each other again. If there is a child involved, you are absolutely stuck with that person, probably for the rest of your life in some capacity or the other even if you get divorced. So it's incredibly important to realize the gravity of the decisions you're making. And I was married very young. I got married at 19. So I, (laughs) yeah. So um, I I know that there's a lot of thinking or or thought process that does not necessarily uh, come before the marriage, even though it should have, but, but up, you know, if you're hearing this now and you're not married yet, it is so important to be honest with the person you're dating for several reasons. And I I would encourage you to think of it this this way. If I bring this up and it causes us to break up, I dodged a bullet because if if it was coming up now, it's never going, if you don't like someone who smokes and being married to someone thinking that, well, they're married now, they're going to be more responsible and stop smoking. That was the biggest lie you've ever told yourself. And that was a very unreasonable expectation. That was an unreasonable expectation on your part to just assume that that person was going to change a lifelong habit because being married somehow changed something for them about that habit. So being realistic about this, the person in front of you is the person you are committing to. And if there are very large problems you know, for me, smoking sets off my asthma. So that would be a non-negotiable. I, I wouldn't even choose to date someone who smoked, but let's say that I did. Um, you know, that would be non-negotiable conversation to have ahead of time. So understanding who you are, what you like, what you don't like, and being able to speak up about it yeah. is important. But I think a lot of times when you're bringing up these issues, it feels like it has to be a fight or like it's definitely going to be a fight. And if you can approach it collaboratively, which I think is is the theme behind all of these topics that we've brought up is that when the person's sick, it's that collaborative conversation. I can't force you to take this medicine or with a job, you can't force your boss to give you a raise, but you can try to collaborate with them for success in that avenue. And it's the same thing with a relationship. You and I are in a relationship. We are working together towards a common goal. We both want to be happy. We both want to be fulfilled. Hopefully we both want to support each other, to support each other's dreams and goals and and outcomes. And hopefully we only want to put each other in situations where we're both comfortable. Hopefully we care if the person that we're with is uncomfortable at, you know, parties. And, you know, for example, my husband was in the military before we got together and he'd been in a a war zone, conflict zone. Um, And he has a lot of issues with, you know, fireworks, I'll just say, you know, we don't go place the 4th of July in the U.S. Uh, We don't go places where there's going to be fireworks. We don't go um, to loud, crowded bars on New Year's because Mm -hmm. that's 
good, it's not a good place for him emotionally ever to be yeah. in a really loud, crowded, rowdy environment. Um, or there's a lot of scenarios like that. I love him. I care about him. I don't want, do I love watching fireworks? Sure. I do. Am I, am I going to force him to come with me to watch that knowing that it's going to be completely overwhelming to him? Yeah. No, because I care about him way more than I care about watching these fireworks live, or maybe some, maybe one year I might decide to, to go with my best friend and, you know, mm. who, but if you truly care about the person, you care about them more than you care about these other little things. And when you're approaching the conversation, it should feel collaborative. I want to talk to you about something and telling them I'm nervous to have this conversation because I'm afraid you might get mad at me. Yeah. Being honest, putting those hard feelings out there in the middle of the room, you know, and helping to set them up for success. So if I came to you and I said, okay, I've got this thing that I need to talk to you about, but I'm really nervous about it because I kind of think you're going to be upset, but it's really important to me. And I need, I need us to have this conversation in your mind. You're already like, oh, okay, she's nervous. I need to try to not, you know, I need to try to help calm her down. Or she, she said that she's nervous. I'm going to get upset. Let me see if I can just go ahead and calm myself down or prepare myself for yeah. whatever the conversation is going to be. You know, when you set that up, the other person go can go ahead and start making adjustments to being more open to the conversation, mm. you know, and saying, you know, you don't need to do this and you don't need to do that. I, I think most of us at this point have heard it, it needs to be more about you. You know, it makes me uncomfortable when we go to these crowded parties because it really triggers my anxiety and I feel really overwhelmed, but I don't, I've never said it to you before because I know that you like to go to those parties and I don't want to be, you know, the killjoy here. And I want to be with you because I like being with you, but, but that situation is just so overwhelming and I don't know what to do. You don't have the solution. You can present the problem and see what that person has to say about it. Again, you don't know what they're thinking and you don't know how you're going to react. They're going to react until bring it up. So you could tell them, you know, I know that we go to these parties like every single week, but honestly, it just really overwhelms me when I, when we do that, because it makes me really, really anxious to be around those crowds. Yeah. That person could be like, I'm so glad you said that I was totally over it. And I, I didn't even want to do it anymore either. They could react that way. Yeah. You don't, if you don't say it, or they could say, well, this is the only way that I ever get any fun in my life. And it's absolutely essential. And I'm never going to give it up. Yeah. Well, that's not what you wanted to hear, but it's good to know it now because just like the raises, we don't give raises around here. Okay. Mm. It's important information that I need to know so that I can make a decision. Am I able to get over the party thing? Or is this something that's such a big deal that it's a deal breaker? Yeah you know, you won't know, but you don't, instead of saying like, we're not going to these parties anymore, or if you want to go, that's fine, but I'm not coming with you. What, how is the person ever going to be able to react well to that? How could they ever respond to, oh, okay, I totally get it. That makes sense. Sure. We don't have to do it anymore. They're never going to react that way. When you're in, you know, knives out, (laughs) throwing down ultimatums, but when it's more about me, it makes me anxious. I don't know what, I don't know what the solution is because you really enjoy these parties and, and that I hate them. What do we do about this and see what that person comes up with, make it collaborative. You come up with a, maybe the solution is that you don't mind that he's going to the parties as long as you can stay home with a good book. And maybe that works for you guys. Every couple is different. Some couples, I mean, with my husband, our dynamic would not we're either going to do it together or we're not going to do it. But I have plenty of friends that, that they and their spouse do, they just have separate hobbies and separate friends. They do things separately a lot and that works for them. Yeah. You won't know if you don't have the conversation, but you have to have the conversation in a way where you're trying to come up with a solution together, not you trying to control them. Because again, you can't control them. You can't make him not go to the party. Yeah, that's true. Yes, Julie. So thank you so so much for bringing that up and also, yeah, sharing valuable lesson for our audience. So we are running out of time. So those who's listening, if they want to work with you or learn more about you, how they can find you. 
So the best place to start would be my website, which is yourconversationexpert.com. Uh, you can contact me through the site there. You can also find a link to my book, Navigating and Avoiding Awkward Conversations, yeah. right there on the site, as well as all my socials. Uh, if you want to find me on Instagram, which is where I'm the most active, uh, that would be at your conversation expert. And I love when people send me DMs and messages and contact me or just to say hello or to let me know something that they'd like to see in my content or just anything. I love to hear from people. So please reach out. Yeah, thank you so much for that. I really appreciate you coming to the show and giving the valuable lesson to our audience. I really appreciate it. So I wish you good luck with your career business and also 2022 which is going to be really great for you, I hope. <laughs> and you. yeah, have a blessed day. Thank you, you too. Thank you. So that's a wrap, guys. You know how to find Julie. Go to our website and our social media and go check out her stuff. Also find our book, get a copy of it. Until then, stay safe, stay healthy. I'll talk to you in the next episode. Thank you, everyone.